All right, what's going on, everyone? Thanks for tuning back to the channel today. My name is Zach Davis, and I want to talk to you about the groaning in Romans chapter 8. I think there's a presupposition from just about everybody that the groaning in Romans chapter 8 is that this has something to do with physical creation one way or another, and I want to talk about why that is not so. Before we get started, don't forget, though, to like and subscribe down below. I want to make an announcement about the conference. If you have received an email about getting your name, because some people are registering multiple names, like you'll buy four tickets or buy three tickets or whatever. We need the name of every person that's coming so we can get it on the name card. That way we can have your lanyard and other stuff ready. So if you have that email, if you do not, if you have not given us the name of everybody that's coming for the ticket that you bought, that's in your email or in your junk somewhere. And Carrie said she's probably sent it about six times. So we're trying to get all those names. So go and send that to us. Looking forward to August. If you hadn't bought a ticket, then Arkansas Eschatology uh, Conference. Just Google that. It'll pull it up the very first thing. And you can buy your tickets there. Okay. Romans 8. Do we have the dirt roads of Arkansas? Do we have the levees? And the fields, where the rice or beans. Do we have all of these things crying out, waiting for the sons of God to be revealed? Or is there a different context that we might should apply the revealing of the sons of God to? Are the mallards that fly in Arkansas, that everybody come, loves to come hunt and pay all of your money, and I don't understand why you pay all this money to come hunt these birds, but you do. Because our people around here go and guide you in the fields for thousands and thousands every year. Are these birds waiting? Travis said, tweet twice to accept Jesus into your heart. We don't think that's the key and that's the understanding of the groaning of the creation waiting for the sons of God to be revealed. You say, Zach, if you don't think that is what it's about, then what do you think it's about? Well, let's look a little bit at the text first, and then we'll um, dig into some observations. Romans 8, beginning in verse 1. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, first off, whose present time is it? Well, it's Paul's present time, and what sufferings were they going through? It was the persecution that Jesus predicted when he said, if you live in this world and, and follow me, then you will have persecution. It's that persecution. It's the persecution specifically that was coming from Old Covenant Israel who were the enemies that were doing the persecuting to those who claimed to be the sons of God? So you have two people here who are claiming to be the sons of God, Old Covenant Israel, and the church, the followers of the new Moses, the Messiah. And that's the sufferings that Paul and his contemporaries are facing. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And if you want to get technical here, go to the Greek. This glory, notice this idea of glory that should be revealed in us is coming from the word mellow in the Greek and it should be about to be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation. You say, Zach, it says it's the creation that's eagerly waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. It is the creation, Zach. It is the catesis and it's the same catesis that Jesus said that Every creature under heaven would hear the gospel, and it's the same catechesis that Paul said every creature under heaven had heard the gospel. And if any man is in Christ, then he is a new creation. It is that creation. It's the creation of what I would call those who are in the new heavens and new earth, in the new Jerusalem, those who had come to the city of the living God, Mount Zion. It's those who are this creation that are in Christ that make up this people who are being persecuted that are longing and desiring to be delivered. And their delivery would be accompanied with the words eagerly and shortly and quickly all throughout the new Testament, because the persecution that they face came from old covenant Israel who would quickly and eagerly be put down. Therefore that would end that persecution for them and they would be vindicated and they would be displayed in all their glory that they truly were the sons of God. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage. Note your word there for bondage. 
And then when you note your word there from bondage, think about all the other times that you see bondage in the New Testament. Think about all the other times that you see slavery in the New Testament. Think about Galatians when Paul continues, continuously says, why are you entangling yourself again to a yoke of bondage? And the entire discussion is about the bondage of the old covenant system who was holding them in slavery and afflicting them will also be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs until now. Groans, labors, creation, bondage, all of the same idea. Even if you want to throw in birth pangs, a woman carries for 40 weeks. You don't know when the baby's coming. Jesus said, I'm coming in this generation. You don't know the day or the hour has a trumpet's reference to it also, by the way. I love it when I hear people say, well, Jesus said he didn't know the day or the hour. Friends, that's a reference to the Feast of Trumpets. Nonetheless, have we seen this language before? I submit to you, yes. And I would also submit to you that this is second Exodus language, second Exodus imagery. Exodus chapter 2, there in Egypt, notice what it says. Now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. Then the children of Israel groaned, because of the bondage, and they cried out. And their cry came up to God because of the bondage. So God heard their groaning. God heard their groaning that they wanted to be released from it, that they wanted to be delivered from where they were being held in bondage and captivity and slavery and being afflicted. God heard their groaning and remembered his covenant with Abraham and with Isaac and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel. That's good. And he acknowledged them. To say it another way, they were vindicated. They were revealed. This is first Exodus imagery. Romans 8 is second Exodus imagery. Friends, that's not the random smashing together of text. That's the Apostle Paul borrowing exactly from Exodus chapter 2. That's the same concept. And that is everywhere in the text. The groaning that happens in Romans chapter 8 has nothing to do with the physical planet crying out, for the revealing of the sons of God. It has everything to do with the context, especially for Paul's discussion in Romans, especially 6, 7, and the early part of 8, when he keeps talking about the law versus the spirit, how the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus had set him free from the law of sin and death, that these sons of God were about to be vindicated and their persecution would be gone, and who were the true sons of God that God would now acknowledge in the second exodus, well, it was always those who were of faith. Don't tell me you're Abraham's descendants. You're of your father, the devil. I don't care if you're ethnically Jewish or not. Only those who are of faith are the true sons of Abraham. Those are the ones who inherit the promise. How many times can the New Testament discuss that and thus not connect the same thing? Back to Romans chapter 8, seeing second Exodus imagery into it. But friends, I submit to you, if you don't, it's probably because we're, we're failing to see the Exodus motif that's in the text there. and we're probably not understanding Old Covenant Israel as the New Egypt, which Revelation 11, 8 clearly tells us that it is, that the witnesses were, their bodies were laid in the street where uh, spiritually it was called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. This has the same context that carries to it. So let's leave it in the context. Let's make that fit and flow perfectly with what Paul's discussing in Romans chapter 6 and 7, leading into 8 and in the early part of 8 which, by the way, will continue on through 9 to 11. But if we do that, then I think we'll have a better understanding of what this groaning is about, and I pray this was helpful to you. If you enjoy what you're hearing here, like and subscribe down below, and we'll keep after it. Next one up in the Revelation series is Paradise. I'm trying to do a little reading up on it and hopefully get one of those coming to you soon. But I'm excited about the Paradise video. It's, uh, it's something that's connected to a lot of things. So hopefully you'll stick tuned. And God bless. We'll see you soon.